Four and a half years ago in 2016, I wrote and directed a short called Groundhog Day for a Black Man, which is about a black man who relives the same day over and over and tries different methods to survive a police interaction. Then one year ago, after the murder of George Floyd, I got an email from Now This News. They said, we've recently seen your short film Groundhog Day for a Black Man and found it very powerful. We would love to amplify it and share the message with our audience. They ended up posting it to their Facebook and their Twitter page. Then one year after Now This posts my short, Netflix puts out a short called Two Distant Strangers on April 9th, 2021. And it's about a black man who lives the same day over and over again and tries to survive a police interaction. It also got nominated for an Oscar. This hit me when I saw in the opening credits in association with Now This. This past Sunday, they just won an Oscar for that short, Two Distant Strangers. And I don't know what happened. I'm not making any assumptions. Stitch with the best thing a therapist ever told you. Despite what you might think, we're not trying to be happy. Happiness is kind of like sadness. It, it's an extreme. It's one side of the spectrum. Really what we're trying to achieve is a state of contentment. It's a, rather than striving to be happy all the time, it's this idea that you're just at peace. It's the feeling where you lay down in bed at night and you don't have that little voice in your head telling you, telling you that you could have done more. Instead, you just lay down and you think, I was enough. Happiness is what happens when you win the lottery or something. Instead, what we're looking for is just a base state of okay. And since then, I haven't tried to be happy all the time. I've just tried to find a state of peace. And my journey has been better. Fun fact, the United States Police Department actually takes more per year in civilian asset forfeitures than actual criminals on record steal from each other. Yes, that means the United States Police Department is stealing more from the people than the actual people are stealing from each other. She's absolutely correct, and here's a great visual representation. And guess who we can all thank for this? In the 80s, Biden worked on several bills with the former segregationist that established mandatory minimum sentences, raised maximum sentences, and effectively created the modern system of civil asset forfeiture, which allows authorities to seize the money and property of the accused without charging them with a crime. Woo! Where's all this from? The government can take everything you own. Everything from your car to your house, your bank account, they can take everything. You got a gun, you commit a felony, 10 years. We already have it, five years. Minimum mandatory. Judge can't say, you know, you had it in your pocket, you never intended to use it, we're only gonna give you one year. Judge has to say, five years. Can someone please help explain to me how is it possible in the United States of America that these police officers keep getting away with murder? My husband, Daniel Shaver, was shot and killed five years ago while crying on the ground, pleading for his life, saying, please don't shoot me. He was compliant. He was unarmed. He didn't even have shoes on. He died in the hotel hallway alone, and they rendered absolutely no aid. The man that shot him, Philip Brailsford, had the words, you're fucked, inscribed into the dust cover of his personal AR-15 that Mesa Police Department approved him to use. He was charged with second degree murder, acquitted, and then reinstated so he could get PTSD benefits for claiming disability for murdering my husband. He's collecting a pension for the rest of his life. Meanwhile, my daughters and I are losing our housing and don't know where we're going to move next month, and we don't have a working vehicle. Tell me how this is justice. So let's talk about Philip Brailsford's gun, the one that said, you're fucked on it, the one he used to protect the citizens of Mesa. So he claims to have PTSD from murdering my husband. But it's interesting because the city paid for him to file bankruptcy as a way to delay our case for two years. Thanks, Mesa. But it also led to us finding out that he was receiving a pension, which we didn't know about for over a year. And I also found out that in his bankruptcy filing, he requested to keep the gun he used to murder my husband. Tell me. If you have PTSD from shooting and killing somebody, do you want to keep that weapon? Do you fight to keep that? What is wrong with him? Is he a psychopath? Nope, he's just apparently a regular Mesa police officer because that's what they say. Apparently that's just common out there and it's just totally accepted and normal and nobody's gonna do anything about it because nobody knows about Daniel Shaver. So next up, let's talk about Sergeant Langley because we sure haven't forgotten about him. Sergeant Langley was in charge of the scene that night. He was investigated and served a notice of investigation saying that they were looking into his involvement and he retired that day, secured his pension and fled to the Philippines where you can't be extradited back to the United States. 
You literally can't even make this stuff up, you guys. Research it. Research Daniel Shaver's case. It's wild. So that's not one, but two officers in this case who got away with murder who are collecting a pension for the rest of their life. Come on, you guys, really? We can't fight to change this? We can't do something? This is ridiculous. Daniel Shaver did not deserve this. He was a good man, a good father, a good husband, a good human being. He cared for people. He was kind. His story deserves to be as viral as everyone else's. For those of you who don't know, I claim discrimination at my job because my male coworker was brought on to do the same exact job as me, given a higher title and a higher pay from the get-go. Here's an update on that. I had my first meeting with HR last week, and uh, they said it's not discrimination because he has a different title. And I said, exactly, he was brought on with a higher title and higher pay to do the same job. Why is this not discrimination? I now had a second meeting with HR and their uh, general counsel today. They said, well, you were brought on as a title assistant, and because you don't have a college degree, we can't make you a title processor, and we can't pay you more. And I said, so you want me to keep doing the job of a title processor without getting paid for it? And they said, well, if there isn't enough work for a title assistant, then we need to be having a discussion of why you're in the company at all. So, fuck them. I'm looking for a new job. There's a lot to try and follow with me. Woman and guy together. Woman becomes pregnant. Guy is abusive and does drugs. They go their separate ways. She gives birth to a little girl named Lily and gets full custody. Baby daddy's sister, so aunt, decides she wants the child and starts making a ton of remarks about how she's her true mother. Bear in mind, she did not give birth to the child. She has never cared for the child. Problem is, auntie is a social worker and her wife is a deputy sheriff. They begin a campaign of threats and harassment. Mother, baby, and family are in a hotel in another county. Auntie shows up wearing her social worker badge and calls a bunch of cops. Cops tell the family she has an emergency court order to take the child. They hand the child over to the police. They hand it to Auntie, she leaves. When they ask to see the court order, cops say, what court order? You gave her over voluntarily. Auntie gets baby daddy to sign over parental rights and now the mother hasn't seen her daughter in over 90 days. Who do you call when social services and the police are the problem? They're in California, they need an attorney, they have a GoFundMe. If you can help, please go to their page. As a white passing mixed person, I hear racist stuff all the time. It's time to expose. Alright, so one time I was with this group of white people. And the girls were talking about this girl who had jungle fever. And this white girl goes, Isn't it a shame to see our race mixing with another? What's going to happen to our white purity? I couldn't believe what I just heard. There was another time where I was at a party, and the only other black person there left early. Right after he left, one of the white dudes there proceeded to say the N-word. Not even in a song or anything, just said it out loud. When I confronted him about it, he said, what? He's not here anymore. Little did he know that I'm a double agent. Needless to say, that situation was handled. There was another time where we were talking about an opposing basketball team. We were talking about why the team was so good, and somebody goes, they're only good because they let all the charity cases on the team. There were no white people on this team. I'm sure I'm not the only white passing person with these kinds of stories, so feel free to do it. It's considered trashy if you're poor, but classy if you're rich. Day drinking. Tax evasion government assistance, thrifting, knowing more than one language, hard drugs, living in a van, having other people raise your kids, mooching off other people, being unemployed, living in a country that's considered third world, being an immigrant, being an actual criminal, and incest. Be careful what you tolerate, because all you're doing is teaching people how to treat you. First of all, thank you for your support. Growing up in Indiana, I did not see the Confederate flag and think there's an ally to the Jewish people. And you know what, man? You asked a great question for a third grader. So let me answer it. Right after the Holocaust, my people received billions of dollars in reparations, some of which paid for that painting. I'm just kidding. My mom did that. Oh, and one could argue we also received a country. You've heard of Israel, right? And all black people received was Jim Crow laws, redlining, denial of access to education and health care, a systemically racist police force and prison industrial complex. Even to this day, there are billions of dollars of wealth lost in the black community because their homes are artificially appraised lower than white people's homes. Anyway, kind of a funny question coming from a guy flying a Confederate flag indicating that you are not actually over losing slavery. But I do want to say we still complain about a lot of things. Like my coffee gets cold too quickly. 
and I love panna cotta, but it has tons of cholesterol. This is why you should never say developing nation. Hi, I'm a person who is from and currently living in Colombia, one of those minority developing countries you mentioned. Uh, and I wanted to give you my opinion on the subject. Basically, uh, we don't really care, dog. <laughs> you can call us developing, in development, underdeveloped, third world, minority, majority country. It truly has no impact on us. Uh, what does have an impact on us uh, is that I recently opened my small print business. <laughs> They're all by me, my, the signs of my favorite hip-hop and pop artist. And basically it's because the reality is that you buying a print of my design uh, becomes money I can circulate in the local economy and it has an infinitely bigger impact on my country than a lifetime of you being careful of what word you use to describe us. What was that flip of a switch moment that permanently changed your life or perspective? I have been to three countries in Africa, Ghana, Gambia and Togo. And in all of them, I kept noticing this strange thing. And it was landfills. But there were landfills that were taller than skyscrapers and longer than towns. They were huge. And I kept noticing that in all of these, there were people living in them. And many of them were children. And what they would do is they'd find something in this dump that they could possibly sell. And that's how they get money to get food. But by this point, most of the things in the landfill had turned kind of a black sludge. So it was difficult to find things and obviously full of disease and dirt and stuff. I then went on a kind of personal mission to find out why this happened and that led me to downloading and reading a lot of what Julian Assange leaked. And in that there was evidence that European and American companies were taking what's in their landfills and also nuclear waste and dropping that off in Africa illegally. And that's what made me committed to anti-capitalism. I'm the exact same way and I don't think I like it. I just watched The Social Dilemma on Netflix and all of these social media app developers would talk about how social media slowly and subconsciously radicalizes us with no purpose other than to keep us engaged with the app and how dangerous and manipulative that is. Personally, any conclusion that I come to I like to have made on my own and I don't like being manipulated. Before TikTok, I didn't really interact with cis straight men, they just weren't really in my friend group. After TikTok, I still don't really interact with them, but now I just sit around and hate them. And I don't like that for a few reasons. One, I know I didn't consciously choose to feel this way. Two, I don't really like to spend my time just sitting around being angry. And three, I know that that time, energy, and brain space used to go to something probably more productive and positive, and now it's just not. So I'm very consciously de-radicalizing and I encourage all of you to see what ways you've been radicalized and decide how you feel about it for yourself consciously. $46 for OSV. When is the madness going to stop? I'm a flatbed truck driver. I haul a lot of lumber. I can tell you, these lumber yards and these, uh, the actual uh, sawmills, and the third party here it is the third party lumber buyers they have this lumber stacked up as high as the forklifts will go they are holding on to it and just barely trickling out a little bit here and a little bit there to keep prices drive up i've seen it with my own two eyes that's what's going on they're controlling the market they seized the opportunity when COVID hit because that's when i noticed that the the uh, sawmills never slowed down, but the the uh, lumber uh, loads count went down. So that told me right there that somebody's holding on to it. Somebody's buying it and holding on. Okay, here's a bunch of things I hate on TikTok. And I'm seeing more and more of these and they all have gazillion views. I don't understand. Like when someone duets or stitches an emotional video and they put it above and the whole time they're underneath going... Like, dude, just show the video. You don't have to. <laughs> like, we'll get it. What also drives me nuts is when people have a meme in the background and they're reading it and reacting to it and laughing so hard as if they just read it now for the first time, but they had to stitch it and put it in the whole video so they read it before to know it was fun. You know what I'm saying? Oh, and the laugh is completely forced, by the way. Example. Soy latte. Good morning, mucho. <laughs> it's not that funny. I mean, maybe you can, <laughs> that's it.